Okay. So, um, I will uh, make a short presentation because after we have to listen to the last chronicle on Mars by Jean-Pierre Bivring. Uh, on some new data we obtain, and uh, this is really new unpublished data, uh, on noble gas and nitrogen isotopes in some uh, inclusion, fluid inclusion in the, one of the oldest uh, rock ter uh, terrains that we have in northern Quebec, the Nouveau-Aguituc Belt. And this is a work as done by the undergraduate Elodie Béraud that uh, he came in my laboratory during the summer and did uh, this work on studying noble gas and nitrogen isotopes in this rock. So the first question is why we want to study volatiles or uh, atmosphere in Archean rocks because uh, most of the um, evolutionary models of the surface environment of the early Earths, like the atmosphere, the oceans, is based mostly is constrained uh, using cosmochemical data from meteorites, comets, etc. Because of the scarcity of the isotopic record we have on Earth, so we have a very few rocks very few outcrops um, to obtain uh, good data. But it's in, uh, essential to validate these models by studying some, uh, if possible, pristine isotopic composition. Uh, during uh, the three days of the school uh, before this conference, several times has been asked me and other colleagues, do we have direct evidence of the pressure of CO2 or the nitrogen, etc. So, important question, and so we have to try to find this information in the rocks, studying these uh, uh, volatile uh, elements. So, just to make an example, sorry, this is a slide in French, um, about the early catastrophic degassing of the planet, that uh, make the volatiles brought by comets and asteroids on Earth to be degassed from the mantle. Um, it can be uh, modeled uh, knowing, for example, the evolution of the ratio of the argon uh, uh, 40, argon 36. During the school, we saw another example of using iodine 129, 130, to know when this uh, uh, happen, uh, how it happened, this catastrophic degassing that uh, make it volatile to be uh, available on the surface of our planet. So in these schematics, uh, I, I, the, the theory is that the argon-36, that is a primordial uh, isotope of the noble gas argon, has been the gas very early in the atmosphere. It's probably corresponded at 50 million years after the um, 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 the formation of the planets, and uh, so the initial ratio is something calculated at 210 to the minus 4, the ratio between argon 40 and 36, and the models say that uh, the argon 40 has been produced by decay of potassium in rocks in the continental crust, uh, increasing the, uh, the volume of continental crust and production. This ratio should have increased, so the amount of argon 40 increased during time. That means that if we go search rocks in different, with different age, from the start of the formation of the planet, we should see this argon 40, 36 atmospheric one increase up to the value of today that is around the 300. And this is not easy. So there were an historical paper, for example, from uh, Cadogan in uh, 1976, if I remember well, in Nature, um, uh, claiming that uh, he can measure value of 4036 in some chart a little bit lower than what he was expected, so around uh, 240, 250. And it was a quite a big debate, and very recently the group of CRPG in Nancy, he published in 2013 a paper where they can separate the in situ production of argon and reconstruct what it was the atmospheric 40 argon 36 uh, ratio in uh, three rocks coming from three different periods, 3.5, 3, 2.7, and they obtain uh, values that are lower than present day, and so they can model what it was the degassing evolution of, uh, of these uh, elements in the, in the terrestrial atmosphere. So this is an example the importance to try to obtain data from rocks at like what they can give. But this study is quite rare. If we include the previous one we saw, 
uh, there was a, an initial work done in 1990 by the group of Yuji Sano when he was postdoc with Colin Pillinger, Open University, tried to use the nitrogen argon to, to, to uh, measure the time evolution of the atmospheric uh, uh, isotopic value of nitrogen. Uh, again, the same group uh, uh, doing the few data existing of noble gases, uh, heavy noble gases at least, uh, like krypton and xenon in uh, Archean rocks. In uh, 2001, we published a paper with a group of uh, TITEC and the group of Osaka showing uh, mantle xenon preserving in Archean rocks. And most recently, again, the group of uh, CRPG in Nancy uh, this paper where they claim uh, they can calculate the partial pressure of nitrogen and the nitrogen isotopic composition of the arc in the atmosphere. So we decided to give a look uh, to uh, volatile in, uh, inside the fluid inclusion of the Nouveau-Aguituk rocks. The Nouveau-Aguituk is uh, here in the northern Quebec. Uh, in the bay, uh, Hudson Bay uh, uh, eastern side, and uh, this is um, uh, rocks that are among uh, is a metavolcanic sequence, quite highly metamorphosed, and uh, uranium lead age on zircon give a maximum age around 3.8, and this rock is quite known for this big debate about the presence of negative anomalies of uh, extinct radionuclide uh, neodymium-142, uh, that claiming that this rock could be even older, up to 4.3 billion years. Uh, this is a diagram that uh, Hervé Martin showed during the school of uh, the uh, neodymium isotopes, and they interpreted this uh, spurious correlation like uh, um, um, an, an isochron obtaining this age of 4.3. Now people think that this is reality mixing between two components, uh, modern terrestrial and a component uh, uh, with a, a con that have some uh, contain some crust uh, um, these uh, deficiencies uh, in uh, neodymium, and uh, the melting of this rock uh, gave the present rocks that probably have an age of 3.8 billion years. So the objective of this ongoing study, this is really the preliminary result, it was to study the isotopic composition of volatile nitrogen noble gases in, this ro in different lithologies of the new Wagituk uh, Greystone Belt. Uh, identify the isotopic composition of, uh, to try to obtain some information of the, of the environmental condition in New Archean period, so at around 3.8 billion years. Why noble gases? Because they are atmosphere elements, they are rare and chemically inert, so for this reason are among the best geochemical traces of geological processes. They generally have two components, uh, primordial one and radiogenic. Uh, of course, everybody will want to find in these rocks primordial component rather than radiogenic, but the rocks are old and you have a lot of elements producing radiogenic noble gas like helium, like argon, so you cannot really skip uh, uh, this radiogenic component. I will show the radiogenic component in this presentation can be important and give some important clues. And uh, so the isotopic signature of noble gases are generally related to the original terrestrial reservoir and just modified by physical processes, not chemical processes. So they are very powerful tracers. As I said, they are able also to defeat uh, Superman. Okay, why nitrogen? Nitrogen is an atmosphere element, again. It's a life-related uh, elements like carbon uh, or phosphorus. Uh, it can be fixed in sedimentary environment as stable form ammonia, often replacing potassium in uh, potassium minerals like feldspar, micas, etc. In the N2 form, in the atmosphere, is uh, very stable. It's mostly chemically inert because it uh, has a very strong uh, triple bond. And uh, this characteristic makes that uh, it can be used uh, together coupled with noble gases in several reservoirs for tracing uh, processes. This has been demonstrated in work on the mantle and the, or, or in the crust. Here is just an example of literature. I work a long time. I, I make a long series of publications on nitrogen isotopes 
in the past when I was an as a pseudo astrobiologist and now I'm working completely different stuff. But uh, this is just an example: the isotope of argon against the isotope of nitrogen. This is a 3.5 Pilbara crat on a chart and shows some component uh, of this. Uh, uh, nitrogen argon in these rocks, it can be a mixing between uh, crystal fluid bringing sedimentary nitrogen argon and probably mantle nitrogen and argon in this kind of rocks. This is just to make an example how to use this uh, uh, um, uh, volatile. So this is the nouveau to Griston belt. It's quite complicated, uh, anticline with uh, very high metamorphoside. And what is important in this area is that this uh, uh, brown rocks that is called the faux amphibolite because this is an amphibolite but the color is not like classic gray of an amphibolite. Amphibolite is a magmatic rock. Uh, it contains a lot of, uh, of uh, garnet and uh, cumin tonite and the color we will see is uh, pink. So it's quite strange and is interpreted as a, a volcano sedimentary rocks. Here in red we have a boundary iron formation uh, similar, uh, the, the one is observed in Isua that have the same age. This is probably Isua and Nuvagituk, maybe it's a piece of the same craton. Um, and, and then we have a cross cut by tonalite, uh, uh, gabbros, uh, intru ultramafic intrusive. So we have uh, several magmatic rocks that uh, uh, cross a little bit younger these uh, uh, rocks. So the four amphibolite is the rocks that uh, was given this age of 4.3 billion years. But as I said, the zircon give uh, 3.8. So the zircon come from this rock. So we have a gabbro and seal, ultramafic intrusive, the sample rocks. We have this famous four amphibolite, tonalite, and uh, felsic schist that is interpreted like sedimentary rocks. Uh, zircon coming from this uh, schist gave a 3.8 billion years old ages. Uh, something that has been interpreted like a conglomerate, but you see here, the, the, if it's true, is completely crushed because it's a highly metamorphosized. Uh, Bander ion formation here, so what we expect is more sedimentary origin. So, I will skip about analytical, but uh, we analyze uh, this in our laboratory for noble gases using a small uh, uh, quadrupole mass spectrometer. And uh, nitrogen has been done at Osaka University using another uh, quadrupole mass spectrometer dedicated to this uh, work. So here just uh, I report the some isotope. Some of them is uh, generally is, uh, uh, is, can be produced by radiogenic by um, uh, nuclear reaction. Helium-4, Neo-22, Argon-40, Krypton-86, and Xenon-132. They are normalized to 36 argon against the value of the air. So if it's atmospheric, uh, um, today atmospheric uh, contamination, or it just contain uh, um, um, their value is uh, close to the atmosphere, it should be on this line one. And we can see that except the neon, uh, that is sometimes is lower than what it should be expected in the atmosphere. Uh, here we have all values that are much higher than uh, one, 10 or 100 times, indicating uh, production of helium-4 from uranium and thorium, uh, production of uh, um, argon-40 by potassium. And interestingly, we have a big anomalies, very large, in xenon-132 and krypton-86. Uh, they can be, the first one, it can be, or uh, both, they can be formed by uranium-238 fission or plutonium-244 fission. This is very interesting because today on the Earth we don't have a plutonium-244. It's another of these called extinct radionuclides with a half-life of 80 million years. And this is interesting because if it's a plutonium-244 forming these uh, isotopes, it means that this rock should be an age 
when the, the uh, element parents was uh, still existing, that means uh, 500 million years after the formation of the Earth. And so we can validate or not uh, this uh, strange age of 4.3. Um, the light and Nobel gas would not interest because uh, they are quite the gas. Uh, this is, can be seen just if we plot the ratio between helium and radiogenic argon. Uh, the minimum value we can have uh, in a terrestrial rocks is uh, 2.5 if uh, these two isotopes have been uh, produced in the mantle by decay or potassium and uranium, or 4.5 in the crust. And we have a value that are much less because the helium is a small molecule uh, element that can be diffused out. So it's generally is not much interesting this kind of rocks. It just is produced a lot, of course, by in situ production, but nothing more. So in this figure, we report the uh, 129, 31, 32, 34, 36 isotopes of uh, uh, xenon uh, uh, report as a delta xenon, like uh, the classic delta notation that we generally use for stable isotopes. So the ratio of each isotope against 132 divide a standard that is uh, here used is the modern atmosphere, uh, multiply 100, not 1,000. Uh, 1, so this is not per mil, but is percent deviation. And you can see that we have a huge deviation from the atmosphere. That means we have a huge production of this physiogenic uh, uh, xenon, uh, up to 80% deviation. Um, this is uh, for the tonalite, that is magmatic rocks. Here is the four amphibolite, so this strange rock uh, that uh, gave this strange age of 4.3 uh, billion years uh, suggested. As I said, it can be formed by fission of 238 plutonium. There is another, a fission uh, of 235 uranium, but it's not an important source in the geological environment, so it's these two possibilities. And uh, if it's uh, plutonium 244, uh, it means that the rocks have been formed before the extinction of these isotopes. It means before 500 million from the Earth formation. It means it should be have more than 4 billion years, the rocks. If it's uranium, it could be younger, so having the age, uh, supposed age of 3.8 billion years. Um, Again, if we look at uh, sedimentary rocks like a boundary formation, again, we have this anomaly in uh, 131, 134, 136, obviously also in 132, but being used as, a, as a for um, normalize, it's, uh, it, it, we cannot see this anomaly here in this uh, uh, diagram. Uh, there are several questions about uh, the origin of this xenon and so the parent fluids and the rocks that contain this fluid. Is a xenon formed by uranium-338 or plutonium? In the first hypothesis, fluid and earth rock could have any age between, uh, let's say, 4 billion years and younger. So after the plutonium has been extinct on the Earth. The second hypothesis is the Floyd and Oss rock should have formed within 500 million years from the Earth formation to have the plutonium still existing and producing anomaly. And then what is important is to know is it a mantle fluid or crustal fluids, because this anomaly you can have also in mantle rocks. So this is very important. We are looking at magmatic rocks, but at the same time also some seems is sedimentary rocks like a boundary ion formation. So the solution to this dilemma is when we plot, uh, for example, here the 134 against 132 xenon against 86 krypton, 84 krypton. Uh, 86 krypton, it can be again produced by both type of elements, uranium or the plutonium. And this is huge anomaly. Uh, we have only an example of anomaly from the paper of Sano, around 0 0.4. Here is around 0 0.7, this is tonalite. That means that these rocks and the fluids has been isolated at least for three or four billion years to be able to produce this large anomaly, both of physiogenic xenon and physiogenic krypton. And what is interesting here, we see there is a mixing between this component that is a 
probably the most pristine fluids containing xenon and krypton, diluted by modern atmosphere contamination. Contamination of modern atmosphere is everywhere in the terrestrial rocks. We cannot avoid them. But what is interesting is that uh, if it's the plutonium that produces uh, these three isotopes, uh, they should plot on this, uh, on, on this line because uh, the production of krypton-86 is very small by plutonium-244 complement uranium. This uh, suggests that uh, these rocks is not older than 4 billion years, but the zircon age, the 3.8, is the real age of this terrain. So we have no anomaly related to plutonium. Uh, there are probably crustal fluids. It's not mantle fluids, because if it's a mantle fluids or is mantle, we should observe an anomaly of 129 xenon that is produced by another extinct radionuclides, 129 iodine. And this anomaly we can observe only in mantle fluids, and we don't have uh, this anomaly. The second point is uh, to uh, discard the fact that it is mantle fluids. It's uh, that uh, if it is uh, uh, in the mantle, we don't have anomaly of uh, krypton 86. So if uh, we plot uh, mantle uh, uh, krypton xenon, it should be around uh, here. So no anomaly of krypton 86, but anomaly of this uh, xenon. Uh, so, we can discard both hypotheses, and so the most uh, interesting hypothesis is that we are looking at uh, very old, maybe 3.8 crystal fluids. Also because this, this, and this is a secondary fluid, uh, because we can see both in magmatic rocks, then in the sedimentary rocks. So it's probably some fluids that enter these rocks, but uh, just after their deposition, and accumulated this large anomaly of krypton xenon. What is very interesting is when we look at nitrogen. We didn't expect at all. Um, um, here, for the moment, just showing the nitrogen against argon concentration, and I accepted this value uh, of this. Uh, this is a gabbro, is a magmatic rocks. Uh, these are the magmatic rocks, and this is our sedimentary rocks in violet, and blue is a tonalite. We see some correlation between the concentration of nitrogen and argon, and this is normal to see in, in some case because if it's, this is a let's call a sedimentary nitrogen, so nitrogen from atmosphere or, or the oceans that is a fix in clays, minerals, uh, is a fix as a ammonium, as I said, with little or no isotopic fractionation compared to his source. Uh, this, is, uh, this fixation should be biologically mediated, so we can ask ourselves if is, uh, this is indicating some biological activity. Uh, but what is, is important so that uh, this ammonia is uh, replaced potassium in potassium minerals and the potassium is producing argon. So it's normal to have this genetic relationship between argon and nitrogen. But what is more interesting, is, is one of the last slide, is in this few samples we did, so uh, now we had did a lot of, of noble gas in other samples, so the next step is to do in all the rocks we did noble gas is to do nitrogen, is that except this gabbro here, uh, we have again a trend between uh, modern atmosphere, delta 15 equal zero and uh, 40, 36 equal 300, and uh, something that is very rich in, in argon 40, so is this uh, pristine fluids, but the delta 15, we expected like 20 or 30 because this is metamorphic rock. So we were expecting that the value was quite high. And in fact, we find something that is very light, is isotopically light, two, three per mil. And this was not expected, but it's very interesting because again, it could indicate that we are looking to some surface nitrogen coming from the oceans, from the atmosphere, or whatever, that is fixed inside some mineral and then releasing these fluids and is keeping very light uh, isotopically uh, signature. And this has been observed also in uh, rocks of uh, similar ages. And uh, if this nitrogen have a 3.6, 3.8 billion years, the age of the rocks, 
and uh, if he's uh, slightly fractionated compared to source, and if his source is a surface nitrogen, could be, as I said, an atmospheric or, or, or from the ocean, but atmospheric nitrogen. Um, it's very interesting because uh, this is a work uh, from uh, Yuji Sano that he showed uh, what he, he considered possible polyatmospheric nitrogen in different ages, trapping in different uh, rocks, mostly chert, from today to up uh, 3.2 billion years in, uh, in uh, South Africa. This is a work we had in Pilbara, work I did uh, several years ago, and in Israel, some data here, and this is the two data uh, from uh, Nouveau-Gituk. We see that uh, uh, nitrogen has been always more or less constant, that the surface reservoir containing nitrogen were slightly fractionated, but always more or less uh, the same value around 2, 3 per mil within a today value of the atmospheric nitrogen. Uh, so what is the implication or, or if uh, this nitrogen is really atmospheric nitrogen and so fully uh, isotopically fractionated is that, uh, oh, sorry, uh, um, is indicated the, probably during this early archaea, the Earth was protected by, already by a magnetic field. This magnetic field should be at least 50% of the present field intensity, because if we don't have already the magnetic field, this is a photo, uh, figure, famous figure from the work of Tarduno, um, uh, showing the variation of the intensity of magnetic field from uh, 3.5 to today, billion years ago to today. This is the value if uh, we assume that is uh, what we observe in uh, Nuwagituk is true. Um, if there is no magnetic uh, shielding, um, the atmospheric the nitrogen will be strongly fractionated uh, by solar wind and the as a probably is uh, what has been uh, what's happening on the atmosphere of Mars. We know the atmosphere of Mars, the uh, noble gas like argon, nitrogen, DNH is strongly fractionated by hydrodynamic escape when the, the, the atmosphere and possibly the oceans of the Mars has been stripped out uh, uh, from uh, uh, the surface. And so uh, this is one of the possible implications of uh, this uh, value uh, sl slightly just fractionated that we observe all, our, all uh, over uh, the, um, the Earth history. So this is our the conclusion. So the, this very preliminary data show that we have uh, um, a strong anomaly of physiogenic krypton xenon together with radiogenic uh, argon-40. Um, the relation between krypton and xenon excludes the possibility that we have a plutonium 244 that has produced this anomaly. So these rocks are not so old as believed before, are certainly less old, younger than 4 billion years when the plutonium was not present. These common crustal fluids that we can find now in both magmatic and, and sedimentary rocks. Um, um, needed to have ages of Archean to produce uh, this, uh, strong, uh, sorry, this anomaly. And what is very interesting that uh, we have to confirm is this uh, light uh, sedimentary, possibly sedimentary nitrogen. So next step is to measure this nitrogen, for example, in boundary ion formation or in, or, or in other rocks that are assumed to be uh, sedimentary in origin. And so before asking you the question, uh, another uh, puzzle to resolve. Uh, I've taken this photo yesterday. I understand that it is forbidden uh, for bikes to pass through this road. I don't know how you can make a car passing through this uh, street. So thank you for your attention and... Uh